Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, Top Job Employment Agency. Ellen Sykes speaking. How can I help you? Good morning. My name's Steve Collins and I'm calling about the call centre job advertised in today's paper. For an operative handling credit card inquiries? Yes, that's right. The wages and working conditions are all in the ad, so what I'd like to know now is what the work actually consists of. I should explain that I'm a student looking for a summer job, not long-term employment. That's OK. The people at Intercard say they've always found students to be honest, which of course is essential in this line of work, and they have the basic IT skills needed there. Apparently, there have been a few who didn't find it easy to get there on time in the morning, but in most cases their punctuality is as good as anybody else's. Anyway, about the work, and I know a bit about this because, as it happens, I've worked there myself. Really? Yes, for about a year. You'd find that most callers would be people wanting to check the balance on their cards, query payments made and so on. And from those who've had their cards stolen? No, they ring another number for that, an emergency line. People also call that number if they lose their cards. And what are most callers like? I mean, what kind of people are they? All sorts, really. All ages, every kind of background. Though one definite trend is the change in the number of women. Nowadays, they make up around 55% of the total, whereas years ago, there used to be a majority of men calling. At one time, I heard, as many as three quarters of all credit cards were actually held by men, but that must have been long before I was there. It's certainly different now. So to do this job, what sort of experience do I need? None, really. Have you got a credit card yourself? Yes, I have. Then you probably know quite a bit about them already. And as a student, you're obviously intelligent, which of course you need to be for the job. So after a day or so working with an experienced operative, I'm sure you'll have picked up enough to deal with routine inquiries, which of course most of them are. But there are bound to be questions I can't deal with, at least at first. What happens then? In that case, you can ask a supervisor. They're very helpful to new staff. I think I like the sound of this. What do I do next? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Can you get over there for 9.45 on Monday morning for an interview? Definitely, yes. Whereabouts are they? In Riverside Business Park. Do you know it? Yes, I've been there once. How do you usually travel? By bus. Right. So you take either the 136 or 137 to the bus station, and when you come out of there, you turn right. Along Orchard Road, that is. The road from the railway station? Yes, that's right. You go past the petrol station next to the car dealers, then carry on down the road. Do I take the first left at the main car park? Well, you could do that and walk up Newfield Avenue alongside the shopping centre, but it's a long way round. I'd suggest continuing along Orchard Road with the water company and then the insurance offices on your right. They used to be local government offices, by the way. Yes, I remember those. And you keep going until you reach the advertising agency. 
Now, facing that is a small road called Cherry Lane. There's a newspaper office on the corner, and opposite that is a big hotel, so you can't miss it. And how far down that road is it? Well, they aren't actually in Cherry Lane. You walk as far as the next junction and turn right into Armand Drive at the mail centre. Intercard is in the third building on the right between the airline offices and the shipping company. Fine. I'll be there on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye. Good luck. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. To hear a reporter from the New York Times who is presenting a news report prepared by Dion Sierce and Robert Gebeloff on the topic middle class shrinks. Further as more fall out instead of climbing up. First look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen to the recording and answer questions 11 to 13. The middle class that President Obama identified in his State of the Union speech last week as the foundation of the American economy has been shrinking for almost half a century. In the late 1960s, more than half of the households in the United States were squarely in the middle earning. In today's dollars, $35,000 to $100,000 a year. Few people noticed or cared as the size of that group began to fall because the shift was primarily caused by more Americans climbing the economic ladder into upper income brackets. But since 2000, the middle class's share of households has continued to narrow, the main reason being that more people have fallen to the bottom. At the same time, fewer of those in this group fit the traditional image of a married couple with children at home, a gap increasingly filled by the elderly. This social upheaval helps explain why the president focused on reviving the middle class, offering a raft of proposals squarely aimed at concerns like paying for college education, taking parental leave, affording childcare and buying a home. Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. Mr. Obama told Congress and the public, still, regardless of their income, most Americans are identified as middle class. The term itself is so amorphous that politicians often cite the group in introducing proposals to engender white appeal. The definition here starts at $35,000, which is about 50% higher than the official poverty level for a family of four and ends at the six-figure mark. Although many Americans in households making more than $100,000 consider themselves middle class, particularly those living in expensive regions like the Northeast and Pacific Coast, they have substantially more money than most people.
However, the lines are drawn. It is clear that millions are struggling to hang on to accoutrement that most experts consider essential to a middle class life. I would consider middle class to be people who can live comfortably on what they earn, can pay their bills, can set aside something to save for retirement and for kids in college, and can have vacations and entertainment, said Christine L. Owens, executive director of the National Employment Law Project, a left learning research and advocacy group. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion among three students who are organizing an international film festival at their college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. OK, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially like the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year I joined the organising committee just like you have now and somehow this year I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations, so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. OK, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. It is held over four nights during study break. Wednesday to Saturday. Normally we show three films a night. Last year we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way, maybe a similar theme. Or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 25 to 30. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision. There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. We just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea. Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussion, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well... We do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language, dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences so we avoid them as much as possible. So how large an audience can we expect and how much does it cost to get in? It costs $5 per film or a $20 pass for the whole event. All 12 films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing. But overall we had a good turnout. More than 2,000 people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about, the financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the program. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion, something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK. Where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a short talk about the banks in Britain. As you listen, complete the statements below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for turning up today for this short talk I'm going to give on student banking. Many of you are unfamiliar with the way banks work in this country, and today's talk should just give you a few starting points. Well, as you probably know, you'll need to open a bank account while you are here. The safest place to keep your money is a bank. Choose one that is near where you study. All the major banks in Britain offer special facilities for students. And will be only too happy to explain how to open an account. The most useful type of account is a current account. You can pay in money received in any form, and then draw it out when you need it by using your checkbook. Writing out checks in their name can make payments to other people. If you want to draw out cash for yourself, make the check payable in your own name or to cash. A check crossed with two parallel lines is even safer. As it must be paid into a bank account, payment by cross check has the added advantage that when the person to whom you have given the check presents it at a bank, it will eventually come back to your bank and provide proof of payment. Most people now ask their bank to supply only ready cross checks. Most banks don't make charges if you keep more than a certain amount of money in your account. However, you shouldn't overdraw on your account. That is. Withdraw more money than you have in without the bank's permission. If you borrow money from the bank, there will be an interest charge. You will also have to pay a small charge to convert foreign currency paid into your bank into sterling. If you have more money than you need for month-to-month -month expenses, it is a good idea to open a deposit account for some of it, where it can earn interest. This interest is taxable. But if your bank knows that you are not normally resident in Britain, then you do not pay tax on it. You can't pay by check on a deposit account, and to withdraw money, you should give the bank seven days' notice, or you'll lose seven days' interest. When you have established yourself as a satisfactory customer with the bank, they can issue you a check card. This is really an identity card, which guarantees that correctly written checks up to the value of fifty pounds will be honoured by the bank. A check card can be very useful, as many shops and enterprises, particularly in London and the cities, will not accept a check unless a check guarantee card backs it. You can also use it with your checkbook to draw up to fifty pounds cash from almost any bank in Britain. If you also ask for a euro check card, this can be used in the same way to draw cash from most banks in Europe. Many banks provide dispensing machines. Generally set in the wall of the bank outside, where you can draw cash when the bank is crowded or closed. Provided you are a satisfactory customer, the bank can issue you a cash card, which allows you to draw up to one hundred pounds a day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.